Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the second webinar in our GDPR series. Today, we are joined by Gerd Beckmetz, Chief Risk and Security Officer at SD Works, and Laurent de Sourgelous, Lead Lawyer at DLA Paper. In this webinar, Gert and Laurent will be discussing implementing inappropriate retention in employee data. You can ask questions throughout this webinar using the box on the right-hand side of your screen. Gert and Laurent will be answering questions toward the end of the webinar. We would like to encourage you to use the hashtag DDPR countdown and the handle at SDWorks on Twitter to give feedback. If you have further questions, you can also contact us at weareglobal at sdworks.com. This live webinar is being recorded and will be sent via email. This presentation and our GDPR international infographic and report are also available for download. I hope you enjoy this webinar and without further delay, I would like to pass you over to Gerd Bexmans, Chief Risk and Security Officer at SDWorks. Hi, good afternoon all. Um, before we jump into the content, uh, I just want to still mention that we also have a European conference, HR conference in London on the 6th of February, where we will also, together with a customer, present uh, a customer case around GDPR and how uh, that customer in particular implemented GDPR uh, and followed uh, the principles uh, that we discuss also during these webinars. So for some of you, it might be interesting still to see also this uh, from a customer point of view. You're all, of course, invited to join there. So we are welcoming you there in London on the 6th of February. Um, OK, let's start with uh, data retention, the topic of, uh, of this webinar. The beginning will I'll shortly explain why the data retention part under GDPR is uh, an important one for HR also to be specific on and to uh, implement the necessary measures to get compliant. Um, first of all, there is the storage limitation principle that is already in the existing directive uh, of uh, under GDPR. Uh, it will remain more or less the same. Uh, the principle is basically uh, quite simple uh, and it states that you can only retain personal data for a period not longer than necessary uh, for the purposes of the processing of the data. Uh, that's a very general generic principle which is uh, uh, seems simple but in practice therefore not that easy to apply. Uh, so far, the law doesn't change, but uh, GDPR will make that storage limitation principle a lot more uh, specific and more strict in uh, the application uh, by adding a few requirements uh, with which you have to comply. Uh, the first one is where in the previous directive, um, it was mentioned that uh, any processing of personal data should not be excessive in relation to the purposes. So that was still quite broad. You just have to make sure that it was not excessive. Under GDPR, they changed this into a real data minimization principle. And that means that you will have to limit the data to what is necessary for the purposes. So there is really a limit into that, uh, not just an explanation that is not excessive, uh, which is nevertheless uh, a big change. Um, and under Recital 39 uh, in uh, the GDPR, you will find a bit more explanation on that one, um, where they clearly mention and state that the period for the processing of personal data uh, must be limited to a strict minimum. And uh, it is expected that uh, you, ex you put uh, specific time limits for erasure or also for a periodic review of the data you hold and if it's still valid or not. So that is the first change already. Um, secondly, um, the GDPR requires you to be uh, a lot more explicit and transparent in the way you manage retention times. You will, uh, in the data register, you will uh, have to set up and define uh, 
there is a obligatory field uh, on data retention. So you will, in your registry for all processing activities that you mention, you will have to put in a data retention time uh, as well. So they will force you to, to become explicit on, uh, on uh, the retention of specific records. Furthermore, um, it is also expected uh, that in the privacy notice, you put this information in a transparent way towards the individuals uh, and your co-workers. So on your HR intranet and uh, on uh, maybe systems that you use uh, towards any individuals or employees that you have, it's important to mention also in the privacy notice clearly how long you will retain that data. You could use the, the, the workers' regulations or uh, norms that you have in, in, et cetera, in, in your company as well for that. Um, uh, as long as it's explicit and transparent, you, you'll be fine. And then the last one is that a data subject or an individual coworker can still challenge you, even if you didn't take all these measures or you put in a retention period that goes quite far or is hard to defend you will uh, you might be challenged by uh, your individual co-workers who have the right to uh, request an erasure of data if they are of opinion that uh, you do not have a valid case anymore to keep that data any longer so to ensure that you're able to cope with that right to be forgotten as also discussed during uh, the last webinar it will be very important to uh, also be clear on the retention times and basically also to uh, the purpose for which you retain the data to make that clear towards uh, the people so they are uh, will have it more difficult to challenge that and uh, to challenge you as an employer on if you're following good practices there. Um, a last one that I also still wanted to mention are specific also data leaks. If you are not, um, if you are not uh, paying attention and you have a data leak, then uh, you might have an issue if you are leaking records uh, of individuals or, or data which should have been deleted already according to your retention policy or according to the typical practices in the market. If that happens, you will also uh, have real difficulty in justifying uh, the data breach and in limiting the claims for compensation or potential sanctions or penalties. So also from that angle or perspective, uh, if you're not clear on data retention, if you're not following your own policies and rules, you put yourself uh, open for uh, higher risk uh, in terms of sanction in case you have a data breach. So that is uh, the basic framework under GDPR, uh, why it is important to, uh, to become very clear and explicit on uh, data retention. I will now uh, pause on the word to Laurent, who will explain a bit more on how you can then in practice define uh, an HR data retention policy. Laurent? Thank you, Gert. Um, indeed. Now, in section two, we'll tackle the issue of uh, of uh, defining a good uh, data retention policy, human resource data retention policy. Now, the first element is that <clears throat> when you operate as a company in different uh, countries, uh, you will notice that there are no uniform retention periods on international level. That would be uh, too easy. So you, you will notice that Every country has its own rules and practices regarding uh, data retention, and uh, these rules can differ uh, greatly from one country to uh, another, which makes it quite difficult for companies because you will need to take all these legal differences into account uh, to avoid any uh, infringement of the law in one specific country. Now, while they all have different rules, they all, the topics are quite often the same. So what you will see in those rules are um, 
minimum what are the minimum uh, minimal uh, retention uh, periods uh, what kind sometimes you see also uh, how you need to keep the data and what in what kind of format it's sometimes mentioned um, now it's basically often laws uh, social laws uh, tax laws uh, company law and uh, administrative slash environmental law that uh, where you find those kind of uh, specific retention policies that you need to take into account and that's a bit the same in uh, most of the countries especially in Europe so um, you need to uh, watch carefully what uh, company law social law or especially fiscal law um, has uh, a re specific retention period. Um, now, it's these also often um, these uh, regulations uh, very different, but often uh, centered around the same topic. Also concern um, specific information uh, or specific documents. So um, they will specify uh, within social law, for example, what kind of documents you as an employer need to retain of, or what kind of um, um, information on tax laws or others you need to retain. Now, just to show you how different the rules can be, we're going to give here in the slide, you see some examples of um, uh, European countries. Now, if you take France, they have for payroll data, um, they foresee a, a retention period of five years. However, if it's um, electronic pay slips, they foresee 50 years or until the employee is 75. And for litigation, it goes up to 20 years. So it's a very long retention period, which implies quite a burden uh, to keep all these data for all your employees. So if you have a lot of activities in France, you have a lot of data to keep uh, uh, from your employees. Germany is a bit, uh, the retention periods are much lower. There, uh, you need to keep data on a minimum wage uh, for a period of two years. Litigation is only three years, contrary to 20 years in France. And payroll accounts for tax, uh, it's six years. In Belgium, um, you will have a lot of, uh, uh, you have um, especially legislation around um, labor documents that you need to keep and uh, also documents regarding the remuneration that you pay to your employees, so payroll documents. And there it turns around, uh, let's say, five years that you have as minimum period of time, you need to keep those uh, data and information of your employees. In the UK, it's more centered around payroll and wage records uh, for a duration of um, six years and there it specified also that this period is from the financial year end in which payments were made and then in East, eastern europe you have poland who is more closer to france for that a very uh, long duration for the uh, employee record so it's 50 years so you see as an employing company in ha having operations in uh, different countries uh, you see how different the retention periods can be and how difficult it is for a company to take all these different retention periods into account. Now, challenges. Well, the first challenge that you have is, of course, uh, Gertin talked about the notion of, introduced by the GDPR of the fact that you have a strict minimum uh, retention period. Uh, of course, when you talk about strict minimum, it's a notion that is very subjective and open to a lot of interpretation. For one, minimum would be a certain period of time, and for another one, uh, it's going to be way too long. So that leaves uh, a lot of room for interpretation and potential issues. 
Another challenge that you have as a company is that you don't find a lot of uh, case law or very limited. So you cannot really base yourself on uh, precedents or other uh, cases that company went through. Um, and if you have case law, it's often related to what I mentioned previously, the fact that in a lot of countries you have specific regulations and then you have case law, a company that did not uh, retain the payroll accounts of a certain, uh, certain employees for a certain period of time. So, of course, you will find those kind of uh, case law, but that will not necessarily help you in finding good um, practices. So, in the end, you have very limited guidance uh, and no clear get best practices if you look around. Uh, also, any authorities in a country, there is not much information you will find about what's now a good retention policy. So that makes your life, of course, very difficult. Um, so the thing that you will need to do, and it's quite important as an employing uh, entity, is that you will have to make an exercise, a constant check and balance exercise. It's quite an exercise that you will need to do constantly uh, when you talk about GDPR and the rights it introduces. But here specifically for data retention, I would say, look if there are any legal requirements for the, de for the document, uh, the specific document that you have um, kept in your database, uh, is, is there anything specific foreseen in uh, tax or uh, social legislation or corporate legislation? So it's often, like I said, the same kind of laws that introduces uh, retention period. So that's the first element that you need to take into account. Do we have a legal obligation to keep this document and for how long? Another element that you need to check is, well, maybe there is no retention for, uh, period foreseen in the law. However, we need this information because there is a potential future legal proceeding against one of our employees or against the, so the social inspection or uh, social security or tax authorities. So there, that's an important element. Those documents we need to keep because we need to be able to defend ourselves against any legal action we have faced. And of course, every company uh, to take certain decision, you need to have certain information in your uh, databases. So that's also an assessment that you need to take into account. Do I need this information to take certain decision, company-wise decision in the future? But then you have the balance and then it's the principle that is introduced in GDPR is the fact that you cannot store uh, this data um, just how long you uh, for a period as long as you want. So you have always this limiting storage period principle. So that's a constant check and balance for every uh, employer. Now, yet, do we have any recommendations to make for uh, the listeners for a good data retention policy? Yes, of course. Um, there are quite a few things you can do uh, as a company or as an organization. Uh, the first one and the most evident, of course, as we mentioned already earlier on, is make sure you know the minimum legal requirements and document those. I can only say seek legal advice there and information in every country and request a good table, both for minimal retention as well as potential litigation periods that you are subject to. Um, that's the first one. But also, uh, in, in terms of setting up a retention policy i think it's important in practice afterwards to have clear information ownership assigned you need somebody for each record or processing activity that you have uh, you need somebody that manages that that takes a periodical review of that that also at least once a year checks are those retention policies that we established still valid are there any new rules or new interpretations that came up and uh, also uh, that periodically can review the data that you hold and perform a cleanup. 
Um, also, I think if you set an HR retention period, I would strongly advise to define first a number of typical overall categories of data and try to set the general retention period for those categories first and then afterwards at any specifics that are different from the general retention period. This will keep it a bit more uh, pragmatic and easy to follow up. And uh, also you will need to take into account your HR processes and systems on that level. Often in your HR systems, uh, they are organized also against specific topics, like example, recruitment or payroll or contract and benefits, etc. And uh, not every system allows you to uh, just uh, put specific retentions on any document or any detailed info uh, uh, that is in there. So on that level, I try to set categories, taking into account the systems you have, uh, the processes you have, and uh, based on those categories, define the overall retention periods. That will be the, the most easy. It's quite easy to lose yourself into a too complex and detailed policy, and you will afterwards not be able to still implement it into your system and processes. So uh, don't go too far either in this. Uh, and then as a last one, I would also strongly advise to organize a periodical review of the information you hold and to keep a periodic cleanup of data. You could uh, organize that as a spring cleanup once or twice a year where you say, okay, uh, we're going to go through the data we hold and we're going to clean up uh, what is no longer relevant uh, and has expired. Because typically in your HR systems, it might be managed automatically uh, within the system. But you will also have still quite a bit of manual documentation being it on paper or unstructured data on file shares, mailboxes, sharepoints, etc. There on that level, uh, it will be a bit too complex to do that uh, on a day by day basis. I think the best way there is to have a, a clear process to once or twice a year clean up the, the data that's no longer relevant in those places. And then you'll be fine. You'll be fine to uh, to uh, comply with all those data retention practices and your GDPR. As an uh, example, I, I I will just oh, I will just add uh, an example of, of a table. In this case, it's a it's a document of. Uh, that mentioned retention periods in Austria. What you typically do is compose a table of the data record or document you're talking about or the category of data. Any comments or references towards minimal legal requirements, towards litigation requirements, or also business practices or business needs, why you need to store that data for a certain period of time. That's basically your uh, your uh, justification for keeping that data a certain period of time. And then, of course, the retention period itself. In terms of retention period itself, uh, some documents contain a minimal and a maximum retention period. I would not do that. Um, for the simple reason is that then there remains a second interpretation to be made uh, on, okay, you say minimum five years, maximum 10 years, but how long do you effectively store that data then? So just keep it easy, to keep, fix one retention period in there and, and keep it like that. Um, the way we do it sometimes is also where we use a code, uh, as mentioned here, C plus three years is typically uh, when you have information that upon the creation of that information, you will not know yet at the, the, what time you will uh, have to delete it because it's subject to uh, other elements, then uh, we typically use a C of completed or closure where we say it's a C plus three years, meaning uh, end of contract in this case for an employment contract plus three years. Uh, the same is with the superseded uh, clause where you often like HR policies or uh, worker regulations or etc. If you have a new version of those, then you could say uh, the old version I keep uh, still for one year and then we consider it gone, then it's typically we state in our retention table or period uh, S plus one, meaning uh, it, from the moment the document is superseded or obsolete, we just keep it still one year. It's a means to implement, you don't have to do it like that, but it's just a recommendation. Uh, 
Other solution could be to add an additional column to the retention period and to say uh, uh, that clearly states the beginning of the retention period or from which it, you have to you take it into account. So uh, that as an example of a clear retention policy that you can then build up. Um, okay, very good. I think we have come now to uh, a few practical examples where we will try to illustrate uh, how we will use data retention within HR and what questions you might typically receive from uh, employees or uh, in case of litigation uh, and where you could use your retention policy to mitigate those or to answer those. Laurent. Yeah, Kert will have the first case, the first example, is regarding the topic of erasing data of, applicant, of an applicant that was not selected. So that's quite a typical case. So if X applied for a job, it was not selected because of a mismatch between company values. Afterwards, it was discovered that the applicant already tried to apply, uh, already tried to apply for a job multiple times. The company would therefore like to keep the recruitment record so that they can first check if an applicant already applied previously. Now the question, how long can they keep recruitment information of applicants? Gert, do we have a, an answer to our listeners? Yes, uh, it's a case we, uh, we also had uh, within SDWorks itself and um, there are typically quite short retention times that are applied on, on that level. Uh, so first of all, a, as a general principle, because you cannot keep data any longer than you really need, uh, you have to limit it to a strict minimum, which means in the case of uh, applicants that you can only keep it uh, as long or that they consent to or as long as they potentially can issue still a claim in uh, as part of the application process. Typically, uh, such claims are often uh, related to uh, discriminatory practices, uh, but the, uh, that's also fairly limited in, in most times. If you look at concrete advice of data protection authorities, and there are a few of those in some countries that have, uh, that have uh, put forward explicit advice on that, then it's typically very short. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, the recommendation of the Data Protection Authority in the Netherlands says four weeks, uh, and it can be extended with explicit consent from the applicant, which is of course not that easy to use uh, and to obtain, and to demonstrate that you have obtained explicit consent to keep his data any longer. So that means four weeks is not long. Um, other example is in the UK, they typically the ICO refers to a, a period of up to maximum six months for recruitment related data. So that means that, that yeah, interview notes, assessment reports, CVs, etc. If you do not have clear, uh, clear consent to keep it any longer, but you should delete those quite quickly. Um, you could keep as an employer a limited record for a longer period of time if uh, you think you have good reason for that. And a typical reason that we often see is a talent pool. Of course, as an employer, if you uh, have a good candidate, but there is a better one uh, that goes first, then you might want to keep uh, the other one that is also still a valid candidate, maybe for a future position into a kind of a talent pool. Well, in that case, it's still possible, but the applicant needs to consent to this. Uh, typically, how you will manage that in, in, to, in today's systems is uh, most companies will use an, uh, nowadays an online system to, to apply for a job and to uh, register applicants' data. There, I think it's important that you clearly communicate the privacy notice in the beginning when an applicant registers himself. And then also that you try to allow the system to uh, obtain consent to keep uh, the data in a talent pool or not. And uh, to have the applicant control over his own data so that afterwards he can still update his CV or maybe delete his CV and his profile if he thinks it's no longer relevant. So if you do it that way, you'll be fine. 
and you don't have to worry about then the uh, overall retention period. Um, but that means uh, in terms of recruitment, it's quite, quite strict. Um, and it might go into a few practices that you use today uh, with your recruiters. It also means that if you use a third uh, company or a subcontractor to do the recruiting for you, that you will also have to establish clear rules on those with such a subcontractor and make clear arrangements on how long he will keep the data for you. Okay, so interesting case. I hope that provides you with a bit uh, of more information in there. Um, Thank you, Geert. That was a very complete answer, but we're going to challenge you a second time. <laughs> so it's not yet over. So we have a second example, and that goes back a bit to what we discussed in the previous uh, webinar about GDPR, which introduces uh, a new right for your employees is the, the right to be forgotten um, and the possibility that you will have uh, certain uh, these types of requests from your employees, especially after uh, a dismissal. And here we're going to look at an example where we have the, 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 the notion of data re uh, retention versus a request of uh, coming from an employee for erasure of his, this, uh, after his dismissal. Now, we have Mr. Z, it's quite funny, it sounds a bit like Mr. Blue and Mr. White and Mr. Pink, like in the movie <laughs> of uh, Reservoir Dogs of Quentin Tarantino. Great movie, but that's another story. <laughs> so we have Mr. Z or Mr. Blue, like you wish, who is dismissed by his employer. And the employer, like you have different countries where you need to justify a different reason why you dismiss your employee. <coughs> and in this case, the employer justifies the dismissal based on performance reasons can be an objective reason. Of course, the employee doesn't like that. And uh, after his dismissal, um, he finds a request and he sends a request to the employer to have to erase all his personal data because he claims that his data, they are no longer necessary in relation to the purpose for which it was originally collected or processed. Meaning that um, there is no employment relationship anymore so it's not really necessary anymore that we keep these data. Um, Kirt, what can we recommend or advise in such a situation? Okay, um, yeah, as explained last time already, Mr. Z in this case has definitely a right to submit that request. It's a valid request from his point of view. As, as a data subject or an individual, he has the right to uh, ask for his data to be deleted. Um, of course, as employer, uh, you should carefully review such a request and you can refuse if you have a valid basis for that. So uh, in this particular case, I think the first thing is if you think or you have a view of that Mr. Z has an intention potentially to issue any legal claim or to confiscate his dismissal, then uh, that's already the first base to keep all the records of Mr. Z in that case until such a claim is settled or initiated. Um, the second reason is, the, of course, the legal obligations to keep certain data. And for some data, uh, yeah, it, it depends on your data retention policy. So there, your data retention policy will dictate how long you keep that data. I would therefore also mention clearly in your privacy notice towards your employees or in your worker regulations, uh, the retention times of the types of data and also certainly includes, include those on performance uh, evaluations uh, because that's the typical case with, in, in dismissal if you use that as an argument where you will have to defend yourself for keeping that type of data for a period of time. Um, yeah, I would like to add on that one is that um, we see a certain trend in certain countries and uh, I'm thinking uh, Belgium, for example, where there was no obligation to uh, motivate to dismissal except in certain specific uh, circumstances. Now you have this obligation so the employee can ask for the reason. Um, and we see a trend that employees um, 
contest the reason that is invoked by the employer in order to get an additional indemnity. Now that can happen in other countries also, it's not only Belgium, is it? Uh, but I'm thinking now for a moment in Belgium. Um, now, often if you, 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 you see that the relationship is not going well and you terminate and that the employee does not accept really, but then that's, that's, that's a red line for you because often also when it's performance related, you have built a, what we, we call a case against him because you know that maybe he's going to be to contest his dismissal. In such cases, it's very important that you keep uh, for the period that is necessary this uh, personal file of, the, of all the elements related to uh, the reasons that you invoke. Because if you invoke, invoke a reason you are unable to demonstrate by any written documents especially, then you have a very weak position in court and you risk uh, to pay an indemnity. A little okay. comment that I wanted to add. Yeah, interesting and an important one, I think. Um, maybe another case that's also uh, often pops up in an HR-related uh, uh, context is the retention of pension documents, um, because those can go quite long. Uh, in this case, uh, is somebody that was employed uh, and during the employment he benefited from a pension scheme that was funded by the employer. Uh, and after this dismissal or after he left the company, he decided to keep uh, or leave the pension reserves in the pension plan of his previous employer. Now that entity uh, went on, uh, went through an acquisition, was dissolved afterwards, etc. And the pension obligations were transferred to another sponsoring company. Uh, and in the end, after a few years, the employee starts a judicial proceeding against this entity for his pension benefits. But the records of that pension plan or regulations uh, were no longer there and were not Yet. Uh, so, Laura, do you have any idea on how we need to tackle such case? Uh, how do you have to take into account the storage of pension documents? Well, uh, first of all, don't lose a pension document because that's very stupid. But uh, to be more in detail, well, but, uh, every company has now pension benefits that you grant to your employees, or it's a, very, it's a common benefit, and in certain countries it's even something that the employees expect you to grant them as a benefit. However, especially if you have a lot of employees, that means also that you have potentially a lot of liabilities because these pension benefits go over a very long period of time and the amounts can be very important depending on the type of, of, of pension benefit that you grant to your employees. However, the law, uh, well, there is uh, it's often the employing entity who grants the benefit, either to a pension insurer or not, but it's your obligation, that's your obligation to pay the pension benefit. But also, if there is any issue with the pension benefit, employees, they will uh, often uh, not go to the pension insurer, but they will go to the employer, because you are responsible for the funding and, and, and other elements. So if you want to defend yourself correctly, it's a bit the same case, as the previous one, well, if you don't, if you lose your pension to a regulation pension plan where maybe uh, you have the provisions regarding uh, the pension, how you compute uh, the formula, if you have lost those plans because those are old plans and, 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 and you moved uh, to another place and those old plans only applicable to certain employees who don't have them anymore, well, you have you, 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 you bear the, the, the liabilities and these liabilities can be very, very important. Don't forget that it's not only for the employer, but in the case we have here, it's a successor. So if you take the pension liabilities of uh, a pre preceding company, well, you are liable not only for the pension, you are liable for the pension benefit, but the employees and even ex-employees, because in the case that Hef described, that is what we call sleepers. That means people that left the company, but at the moment they left the company, they decided to keep their pension reserves in the old pension plan, and then they left. But at the moment, they are 65. This pension right 
opens and they, they, they get you their pension capital, but it can also be a legal case that was brought up by a widow of the pensioner. So it's very important that you, uh, maybe you can even make a specific, I don't know yet what you think about it, but, but maybe you can make a specific category. Uh, of course, you have social human resource document, but taking into account the issues and the liabilities with that, a specific one for pension documents, pension plans and plan pension regulations, and all the other ones, because often you have a lot of annexes to those plans. And it's important that you also keep the, 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 the oldies, huh? because maybe one day you will be confronted with it. Okay, interesting, Laurent. I think indeed the, the best recommendation there is also to make sure you set forward pension documents as a specific category uh, of data in your retention policy and you establish there a clear retention period that can go quite long in, in a few cases, but uh, I think you have the valid reasons for that in this case. Uh, the last case I still wanted to shortly touch, Laurent, is uh, with regard to temporary employment contracts of former uh, employees. So we have a company that hires employees on the temporary employment contracts. Um, how long or should or can the company keep those employment contracts for former employees if they are terminated? Well, first, if you are a company uh, with a lot of uh, temporary uh, employees with um, temporary contracts, it can be burdensome to keep all these contracts for the, the entire duration you, you hire people. But uh, the first thing that you have to do, of course, is to, um, to look, and that's what we said uh, previously, look at the, the legal rules. Uh, are there any retention periods for uh, temporary uh, contracts? I mean, for example, in Belgium, there is no uh, retention periods for employment contracts because, in fact, an employment contract can be also an oral contract. It doesn't need to be in a written form, except for certain types of contracts. And here, a contract of uh, limited duration needs to be in a written form. So you need to keep it for a certain period of time. So that's the first uh, reflex that you should have as an employer. What is the retention period foreseen in the law? The second reflex that you have is, do we face any litigation? Or are we in uh, a litigation maybe? Is there any notice of default? Uh, did the employee send any letter regarding his uh, um, employment relationship that ended? So that's a second element that you will need to take into account and look to see whether you need to keep uh, for a certain period of time. And the third element is um, look also to the statutory uh, limitation periods. Uh, here I mentioned criminal law. Why? Because you have different statutory uh, limitation periods. So your first thinking will be, oh, what's foresees uh, the labor law in France or in Belgium or in Germany, but look also at the criminal law because they can be different and they can be uh, maybe longer or their starting period is different. And um, so if you only take one statutory limitation period into account and not the second one, still you can have some issues with claims that come uh, at a later stage because in different in various countries, uh, infringement of uh, certain laws, I think about payment of salary, can be criminally sanctioned if you don't comply with it. So keep these data, of course, for the period that is necessary. So example of fraud cases? So. A fraud case is a very good example. Uh, social inspection can ask you some documents and if they think there is fraud, they can go for a longer period than the period that is initially foreseen. Um, and it, well, well, of course, it's always important, but that was already said, that you have clear information in your privacy notice regarding your um, retention periods. Okay, excellent. That closes a bit the cases we, we had put forward. We will now uh, do a, a Q&A uh, section where we will uh, look into the questions that you have posed in the meantime. So if you still have further questions on the cases or in the material, Please don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A uh, 
uh, box on the right of uh, your screen, and I will uh, try to still answer them uh, during this session. Uh, the first question I had was, uh, do you have to delete, or are there any other means uh, to, uh, to uh, yeah, uh, make sure that data is no longer available? Uh, on that level, I think there are a few, uh, uh, a few aspects you can do. Uh, a physical delete is one of the elements, but you are also allowed to anonymize in principle. If you anonymize data, and if it's really no longer uh, identifiable in, under any circumstances, then GDPR is also no longer applicable. That is also sufficient as a measure to, uh, uh, to uh, yeah, erase the personal data aspects of, of the data you store. Uh, you could, of course, um, yeah, there see if uh, um, if it's still of any value to keep fully anonymized data or not. That will depend on what you still want to do with it. Some companies would like to keep it for statistical or scientific purposes, maybe, uh, but that's up to you to to decide. Also, in a delete uh, way, there are various means to delete records. Uh, the physical one is uh, the easy one. But you can also have kind of a logical delete where you flag a record as no longer uh, available or seen in the system and that you then afterwards physically delete. Under GDPR, um, I think if you say you, you have no valid means anymore to keep it, then you have to in the end really erase the data, not just flag it as deleted. But it's from an IT perspective also a good practice to, for example, first flag data as deleted and after one month, if you're sure that nobody misses it or there's no, uh, no uh, issue with it, and then only finally delete it uh, so that you have no uh, errors and issues when you delete uh, the data or when you're running the erasure process. So that's, uh, that's the answer to that one. Um, we have um, okay a question about <clears throat> uh, what about keeping documents for reference requests. To my knowledge, there is no specific uh, legislation that foresees anything about a minimum uh, retention period of time. I don't know if you Gert, have any uh, knowledge of, of specific legislation. I so. No, I'm not aware of any specific legislation that that on that level. So I, again, I mean, the, it's the second principle. Um, are you afraid of any? Uh, well, could be uh, litigation. Let's say that somebody, uh, if I understand the question correctly, somebody requests a reference. Okay, you give it to the uh, ex employee, for example. And uh, suddenly uh, you have a legal, uh, you start a legal proceeding for whatever reason. The fact that you gave this reference could be useful maybe in your case uh, because uh, it tried to, um, well, make yourself, I try to, um, to make clear that you are, uh, that you didn't fulfill certain obligation. And the fact that you gave a reference to the employee shows to the, the judge that in fact you are not that a bad employer and that you tried to help the employee to find a new job. So I think you have to take that into account, uh, but there are no specific regulation with, with regard to, if you don't have any issue uh, with this employee, then we don't have to keep it for a very long period of time. I don't no, you, are, you just also, I, I would pay attention also with references in the sense that don't use the way the way as somebody can ask me for a reference to, to say I'm going to keep it for 20 years or so because that will be really difficult to defend. But a, a reasonable period of time uh, that's still valid but you will have to document and, and, and clarify that a bit. Uh, as long as you, you document it and have, a, uh, have it in your policies you should be able to explain it and to, to put a reasonable period onto that. Um, I've also had a question on what if your HR system doesn't enable you to delete data. Well, that's a, that's a rather big problem then. Um, I think from a GDPR compliance perspective, I think your HR systems uh, that you have and employ, you should find a way to, uh, to delete data after the retention period. 
Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier on, you could also anonymize it. So if it's really not possible to delete a record, which, which might be possible due to technical reasons, for example, that the integrity of the database is uh, else corrupt, etc., there might be an option to, uh, to uh, replace the personal identification details of those employees with more bogus data and uh, anonymize the data. That's one solution you could use. Um, in the other hand, uh, on the other hand, hey, you will have to talk to your system provider and you will have to just make sure uh, that he finds a way to comply with that. Uh, and to allow you to delete certain data in the system. So uh, if, if he doesn't, then he will make it impossible uh, for you as a user of that system to comply with the regulations. So certainly to take into account to review and to discuss with your HR system providers. Okay, then we have a question. Um, well, we discussed a lot about uh, retention of data when an employee uh, was an example in, 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 our, um, in our human resource cases when somebody leaves the employee, but what, uh, what, what kind of guidance do we have when an employee, let's say, uh, goes on maternity leave, how long do we have to keep uh, the uh, mater maternity records? Well, there, the first, again, is the first thing, look at the national law where you operate and in which country uh, you have this employee on maternity leave. Um, if the law doesn't foresee anything, I would, I, that's kind of, maternity leave is always quite sensitive, so um, basically I would keep it for a, a sufficient period of time uh, because claims could arise from this situation. So it's important that you can show that you um, that you kept all the necessary documents and that the employee was granted the maternity leave at the per period of time foreseen by the law. Also, it could be that uh, they, it can come from um, national institutions or authorities that would ask you certain data about the maternity leave of your employee because during this period of time, they often get money from the state. So uh, I would certainly keep those kind of documents for a period that is necessary, especially if you think you will, you will have a legal case with this employee. Okay. Uh, next question is a question on if employers can directly receive fines from their employees. Um, not sure I understand the question correctly, but uh, you have to make a distinction between a claim from an employee and a fine by the data protection authorities on that level. I think an employee can only initiate a claim and ask for compensation if he feels that there is damage done uh, by you as an employer due to that, the fact that you do not destroy records timely or there is something wrong with that. Uh, he could also file a complaint with the data protection authorities and they might then uh, open an investigation in this. Uh, but in the end, uh, with regard to the fines, it's only the data protection authorities that are able to issue a fine because you didn't comply uh, with specific regulations or with their advice. So it's not an employee that directly can, uh, can provide an answer on that level. Uh, he can only issue a claim and then you will have to defend yourself and you might end up in court against him, but not any further. Yeah, then uh, we have a question regarding um, for the category of personal data. Um, if we do have to specify for each category that you process and retain, whether you can, in your, pri in your um, privacy notices, whether you can keep. Uh, very general and refer to as long as foreseen by the law, or do we have to specify the duration? Now, my view on that is that uh, often the duration is uh, it's going to be a copy paste for a lot of documents, so it's not that an additional burden to uh, f to specify the duration, and uh, at least you would be more in line with what GDPR foresees as being clear and transparent towards your employee. If you just refer to the law, I mean, of course, every, everybody 
should know the content of the law. That's one of the principles, but that's not always the case. And here it's about data privacy. And with data privacy, it's important of this, especially in GDPR, they really emphasize the importance of transparency. So I would, I would prefer a, a privacy notice with a clear reference to the uh, retention period. Of course, it will need to be reviewed uh, if the law would change, but to my knowledge, this kind of legislation does not change that much. So in fact, it's going to be for a lot of categories of uh, documents, yeah. you will be able to use the same duration. Yeah, also I, what we have done, for example, within SD Works for our own employee data is we, we put in a table limited table with uh, not not with 50 categories but like 10 12 categories where for each category in the worker regulation where we for each category we specify how we we deal with that you could make it general of course if you're challenged you need to have something behind uh, if you put in a in a disclaimer just uh, according to the legal obligations you will have to have in your hand some more detail because if you get questions from a data protection authority or for uh, from an employee you will have to state for specific categories then what that means to the legal obligation and in practice how long then do you keep that so even if you on the disclaimer a, are not that transparent and uh, make it more general then you will have to have some documentation uh, that specifies that in more detail uh, anyway to be able to justify or really state which which uh, retention periods you you apply so it's a bit of balance on how far you want to go in transparency in your disclaimer but in the end you will have to have the table anyway behind it in my opinion um, just stating according to legal obligations, but not knowing what those are in detail and how long that it, that that then you have to keep the data is, is will, will be insufficient. And will not help you as an uh, an employer because uh, if you use those kind of of uh, sheets where you will uh, gather all the information, uh, it's also important for you as an employer that you I mean that you have a clear sight on it that you know. Um, for how long? Uh, so it's it's not only for the employee and to, to comply with the law, but it's also helpful for you and for the person who is yeah. responsible uh, for it. Okay, and then the last question, uh, and that uh, refers to the next seminar. Then um, I think, can you tell us what the data register contain or should contain uh, with regard to retention? You need to specify the retention period in your data registry. You can do that by, in two ways, in my opinion, by immediately entering the retention period or by putting a reference towards your retention policy, which contains the details of uh, maybe more detail of that category of data. Uh, I think both are probably valid as long as you keep those uh, well up to date. Uh, and putting in a reference might be easier to to ensure that there are no discrepancies between the two documents and that you will uh, have issues on that level. For other elements to keep in your data registry, we will uh, refer to the next seminar. Um, the next seminar in uh, February will go in more detail specifically on the data register and what you need to do with that obligation, what you need to put in there and keep as an obligation. So we will uh, go into detail on that level in the seminar in February. Thank you. Thank you, Gert. Um, thank you, Laurent. It's been a very enlightening discussion about GDPR for the HR and payroll world, and especially listening to the real case scenario, really put things into uh, perspective. So this webinar will be available on our website at sdworld.com slash GDPR slash downloads. If Gert and Laurent did get the chance to answer your question, we had really a lot of questions coming through, and obviously with the time constraint, we can't answer all of them. Please email us directly at weareglobal at sdworks.com and we'll be happy to answer those. Do follow our Accounting Down webinar series, which aims to, to guide you month by month um, until May 2018. Our next GDPR webinar, as uh, Gert just mentioned, uh, will take place end of February 2018. Follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to stay tuned about the dates. Finally, if you are interested in attending the European conference and listen, our chief risk officer and customer, Tarek Sen, sharing their GDPR journey story, 
please contact us again to secure your place. We hope to see you there. Thank you very much and good luck with your GDPR preparation.